Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you, John. President Jeremy, Rotarians, it's great to be back. I first of all I'll start off by apologizing last time and running long, so we'll keep it kind of short this time. So I, I, I kind of titled this that the convention center is just another one of those economic engines that's helping making Lancaster what it is. And when I refer to Lancaster, I mean generically between Lancaster City and Lancaster County because we have a responsibility to both the city and the county. Point that way. There you go. So I just, I'm going to hit a couple of things that are in the rearview mirror, some of which went before, just to get everyone up to the same speed, and I'll do it quickly. Uh, first of all is the Convention Center Authority Act that, uh, the, in the state of Pennsylvania that made it possible for a third-class convention center authority to be in Lancaster. And so that was the uh, start of the whole process in Lancaster City and Lancaster County um, in, in 1999, went ahead and incorporated a convention center authority. Uh, the mission of the Convention Center Authority is to provide an inviting, well-managed, well-maintained Lancaster County Convention Center for our guests. And I think we all kind of think that way that, yeah, it's a hospitality venue. But the key is the outcome is to contribute to the economic development of the city of Lancaster and Lancaster County. I really point that out because I look at this as uh, the, the bricks and mortar of the physical asset is the tool in which the authority uses for economic benefit. And we'll get into more of that as we go on. So in, under last year's news, uh, we had talked about some of the uh, key strategic priorities, the commitment to long-term financial stability. We all heard about the bonds in 2014. Uh, we talked about public and private stakeholders, whether that is the city or those are the businesses that um, see um, ramification, economic benefit, from having the convention center, or to those who want a greater level of economic benefit from uh, the convention center being in the area. And the next part of that is supporting the large events. And our board really has done a terrific job of listening to the sales team in what things our customers are looking for so we they can make very good decisions on capital investment. And I'll give you a number one uh, we ha opened the convention center in 2009, kind of an, an awkward time in the lighting industry in that some buildings are still having those um, metal halite like you see in the old gymnasiums when we're growing up, the big uh, aluminum uh, fixtures and all that. And we had that in the convention center. But that was quickly phasing out and LED has really been taking over. Our board embraced that, we changed to LED, not only saving a lot of electricity, but now giving our, our customers more tools to make their events go smoother because they now have controls of each light. They can go on and off, dim, bright, whatever they want, and we even have some color, which we'll show a little later. Uh, the other big piece is contributing to the long-term development of the uh, blocks immediately around the convention center. And it, when we look at uh, the convention industry today, and you've all been to meetings and conferences, it isn't just that building and the services in it, it's what's happening around it. And that's a big piece of what convention centers are looked at today, and the, uh, your convention center authority is looking at that as well. And luckily, there has been so many new projects in downtown Lancaster since the opening of the convention center in 2009. I mean, we look at the uh, 101 North Queen, we look at the Holiday Inn, we look at a lot of those properties and how they're being uh, uh, changing the look of downtown Lancaster. Uh, and then we're also advocates for tourism, attractions, lodging facilities, because we're in that hospitality and tourism industry and we want to be good partners and good stewards with everyone out there. So that was, that was part of last year's the other piece, and I think you all saw this last time around, you know, we came out with our results of an economic impact study. We brought that to the county commissioners on December 3rd of 2018, and we showed that in uh, a slides that they were given in 2005, and then we compared with what we were projecting, the Convention Center Authority, and what actually happened. In all those categories, I'm happy to tell you that those metrics were made. I think at the time when they came out, folks who weren't so uh, positive about the project were saying those are lofty, they're not going to happen. You can say now they are going to happen. But we're not stopping there. We're using that as a benchmark to build. And that's where we're going to take a lot of today's uh, uh, conversation. 
Again, last year or six months ago, we talked about the difference between the overnight guests that go to events at the convention center and those who are day trippers. Day trippers that come in, they drive, they park, they go to the event, and then they go home. But those who come overnight, they spend about $160 a day. And it's about $20 a day for those who are day trippers. So there's a significant difference, and which is why our marketing is for events with as many folks that will stay overnight because of that economic difference. It's roughly about eight times. So then we look at the other economic, uh, what was the results of the 2017, and for those who saw it last March, the, uh, the Lancaster City, our population of what, 65,000 people, saw an economic benefit of $34.6 million. That's a, that's a real good number to start with, but we're not sitting there. And then if we look at the county and the reason why this number is less, these folks have to come from outside the county to be counted. And that wa that's one reason why this has to be less. So if I'm in Mannheim Township and I go to the convention center, this economic impact would say, I'm a benefit to the city, but I'm not a benefit to the county because I'm already here. But if I'm in coming from Reading, I'm outside the county coming in, and that's why that number is where it is. Did that make sense to folks? Okay, good. So last year we showed you this. I did update it. This is the booking pace. And this is really a scorecard of how things are going. So when I look at this, this pace, the priority one, those are the biggest events we have. Those who have events where over 500 room nights are sold on peak night. And when I say peak night, that is the night in which most of the rooms are sold. So if you have a three day event, what night has the most? And in that peak night, did we have more than 500? Or is the accumulative of that event having more than 1,200 room nights? We started out of the gate uh, uh, really slow in 2009. We had a few events and we were going down that path. But to be quite honest with you, there was not a lot of ramp up for marketing prior to opening. A lot of reasons for that, but long story short, we are where we are. And the sales team did a great job of trying to ramp up. And when we got to the um, 2014 refinancing, there was a community-wide collaboration agreement uh, Discover Lancaster, the county, the city, uh, the redevelopment authority, uh, we got together, and the convention center authority, we got together to work on a financing package that Wells Fargo would accept and give us very good rates. So in doing that, in 2014, we started to see uh, a growth in the priority ones and priority twos. So in 2019, we're seeing five priority ones, 12 priority twos, 17 priority events. That will be the most we've had since we've opened. But next year, 2020, we'll have the uh, most priority one events. And I talked to the sales team, and this four right here is gonna move up, and that's gonna be a 13, and that means we're gonna have 20 priority events, which will be the greatest aggregate, as well as greatest number of priority two and priority ones. Sales team is doing their job. I'm thrilled to tell you that. But, in, and now we're in the booking window of 21, 22, 23, and 24. I dropped by the sales office the other day and uh, they had seven new RFPs on their desk, which means time to kick out the proposals, which is great. Uh, so they're doing a wonderful piece of work there. I do want to point out on the bottom under uncharacterized events. When we have events that have more than 500 room nights or 300 room nights, but we don't know where they're staying, and, some of, and most of these are the dance or chair competitions, because all these families come up and they're all over the county, we don't know what the total is. We do know by the attendance and how many participants those exceed either priority one or priority two categories, but because I can't put a finger at it, we call them uncharacterized. So if I did add those in there, you could see those numbers are even greater. We're pointing this out because as we roll down through all these slides, I'm building a case to where the economic impact is coming from and what we're doing to get there. So I talked about the LED lights. 
This is Purple Rain. We joke it to be called Purple Rain. We basically have every color under the rainbow to do an exterior um, uh, a wash of the room as a subtle five um, foot candles of whatever color you choose to be in addition to the regular lighting in the room. It may not sound like much, but to those who are meeting planners and want to set an ambience for whatever event they have, uh, I'm sure when like, shoemakers come in and they're setting up their event and they may want to have a blue hue behind there, we can do those things. I like that segue. Uh, I'm trying. Susan, I'm getting you in this sooner or later. Uh, so we, um, one of the big projects we undertook um, in late 2017 was redoing all the carpeting. But one of the interesting, th I'm sorry, 2018. One of the really interesting things about that is how long it was between opening and putting that carpeting down. Typically, that's a six year rotation, which would have meant we would have been doing that in 2015. But if you can maintain that carpet, and Marriott agrees that you've maintained that carpet and don't mandate that you have to change it, you're saving money because it costs roughly a million dollars to do the, all that carpeting. So if you get two more years, you do that four times, you just save yourself a million dollars. So we have a schedule for the next 40 something years of what our capital is going to be based on the life expectancy of all the equipment. So anytime we're pushing something down the road, we're saving money, and we're not doing that to the detriment of the building. That's key. If there's anything that needs to be replaced, we're going to do it. But we're going to do everything we can, whether it's an HVAC, an elevator. In fact, the elevator interiors are all going to be done in January. Uh, that's a 10-year period, and it definitely needs it if you've been on those elevators lately. So let's look at the next piece. What are we doing to leverage the capital asset convention center to positively impact the economy? And you heard me start off by saying the marketing and sales piece. Well, their job is to make sure that building doesn't sit idle. And we bringing in all of the right events with those overnight attendees. And that those sales and marketing people do a tremendous job. And I was sharing with the team up here that right after this meeting, I'm going to a budget meeting for the sales and marketing department so that we can gear up for 2020 to do even better numbers than we already have. So the next thing is we have to manage these competitive events. A meeting planner wants to make sure all of their details are done smoothly and you always can count on something unexpected happen and how well can you react to that? Is that accurate? Thanks. Uh, so then you have to maintain the facility, cleaning it, and I think the fact that a good example, carpeting. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but anytime someone walks on your carpet, they're bringing pieces of glass, and every time you walk on that glass, you're cutting that carpet. That's really what happens. So when you get two more years out of a carpet, that's a great thing. It means you're doing a great job cleaning it. And I, I, I credit the team for doing that. And then the last piece is investing in the center's competitive advantage. And we talked about the lighting. Uh, we also changed the flooring from having temporary uh, carpeting or using concrete, depending on the event needs, to going full time. Um, a tile carpeted that's glued down with the understanding we can save dates by not having to take up the carpet and putting it down. We lost a date every time we did that. So now the building looks nice in there. It also has a softer feel to it, a little less echo in the room because of the uh, softer surfaces. surfaces. And so we're doing those little things to just take care of what our customers need. And those are going to change over time. In fact, I'll give you another example of that. Commons on Vine, and I'll show a picture of that, um, was originally just going to be a registration area. That's what the architect intended that place. One use, registration. I will tell you, because of the Thaddeus Stevens dig and the glass wall there, we've done banquets there, art shows, uh, uh, musical events, uh, recitals, bridal receptions, you name it. People love it. So the authority is moving the authority's office out of that area to the Lydia Hamilton Smith with the idea we're going to make that a bigger meeting space to attract even larger events and more overnight guests. And you can see how that's all playing. OK, let's talk about the sales effort. So we have a, a gentleman by the name of um, Jason Thompson. And that gentleman goes to trade shows all over the US that have potential customers for our convention center. And uh, as I said, he came home uh, two days ago with seven RFPs from his latest one. 
That's wonderful. And we measure those successes. If you go to this show, we're tracking all of the people and the meetings you had right up until we've gotten a yes or a no so we can evaluate whether we want to go to that show again. That is a very important piece to what we see as being strategic with every dollar we have. We're not Vegas. We don't have $28 million just to throw it at with anything you want. We have to look at it from a perspective of how do we get that return on investment, what shows work for us, and not only do we have a good salesperson and he uh, minds those events really well, but he seems to be getting the events in doing well. He also has customer events. Sometimes when uh, the state association uh, functions in Harrisburg, he may rent out a, uh, a venue up there for a post event um, social or something along that line. Again, build that networking, build that relationship so those folks would want to come to Lancaster. And then also maintaining collateral. Things like our, uh, our exhibit booths, a uh, little less of the paper in the, in the 2019, working on uh, the website, uh, updating some of the uh, key keywords in there uh, to, uh, to draw people to our website. And, th and that optimization is critical. You can't, we find we can't just stand pat with the op optimization uh, language. We have to always be evolving with that. And I'm sure those who are familiar with websites understand exactly where we're going with that. So once that he's out there and he's worked all the shows and he comes home with the RFPs, he's got to address the potential client's needs with his proposal, provide information about Lancaster as a destination. It's not all about the building and it, the responses must be timely. Now here's a, a, one of the competitive advantages we feel we have in the convention business. I made a distinction between convention business and just event business. When we're in the convention business, responding to an RFP within 17 hours is vital. And I know that sounds really, really fast, especially with you come home from a trade show and you got seven RFPs, you're not going to bed. You're kicking out those RFPs right away. You're going to be the first one in the inbox. You're going to be the, what the customer sees when they get back on their flight and they'll know that you're serious. We've done enough data to support that a timely response in the convention world is the world of difference in trying to locate, uh, to land a piece of business. Intermediate goal, client to request a license agreement with their event needs addressed in the proposal. License agreement for us is another way of saying a, uh, a tenant contract, but we don't use the word tenant because there's tenant laws and everything else when you start doing that. Right, John? I figured I asked a lawyer in the room. Uh, <laughs> so when we, uh, and frankly, when you get to the point where they're asking for the license agreement, you're usually on a short list of two or three. It's really then coming down to the economics and then some of the non, uh, how do I want to call this? Did I do that right? Um, the, the decision makers selection process beyond the convention center plays into this. So when we, they talk about why do they want to come to Lancaster? Is it price? Is it location? Is it size? Truth is, is there someone who's championing the location or the other way around? And I, a true story. I worked at a trade show and a gentleman asked about the location. We told him, and he says, my ex-wife li lives there, we're not coming. <laughs> Excuse me, that's really what they said. I, can you believe decisions being made like that? But it happens. So uh, the, the lodging amenities, what do we have for lodging? Now we look at the Holiday Inn downtown and the uh, Marriott's 115 rooms, we've now just increased the scope in which is walkable rooms. Uh, rooms uh, within walking distance of the convention center and provide the amenities that they're looking for. Uh, points, you know, uh, loyalty programs, all those sort of things. Uh, transportation. I know there's a movie called uh, Trains, Planes and Automobiles, but that also plays into how do our guests get here. The trains are fabulous. A lot of our customers use them. Uh, I have a little concern about what's going to happen to that loop because I know the Red Rose Transit has talked about does that get utilized enough but I do know from our customer base, it does get used by those folks. So we're an advocate to keep that. We also have to look at the airlift. Uh, our closest airlift is out of Harrisburg. And frankly, um, 
when you say Harrisburg, because it's not Lancaster, people have a sense that it's too far. And then they also will question about the airlift piece. A lot of them want to come in Baltimore or Philly and take a train, which is fine, but it adds to that logistic. Now, I do want to point out, when you, has anyone ever gone to a, um, a conference or a convention in Denver, Colorado? All right. Have you gone to the convention center in Denver? Okay. How long a ride is it from that airport to that convention center? 45 minutes? Because they call it Denver, they never get asked the question how far it is. But when you say Harrisburg, they're going to ask what that logistic is. And for some reason, that seems further than the Denver airport is from the Denver Convention Center. It is one of the challenges we have. And so we do take it seriously. No sliding of the airport we have in Lancaster. I'm a neighbor of the, of the airport in Lancaster. Uh, the automobile is probably the biggest form of transportation we have for attendees for events at the convention center, that bar none. So we do recognize if they're gonna have automobiles, what's next? Parking. So Lancaster, uh, we did an evaluation and we are gonna re uh, revisit this in 2020, uh, a study of the amenities in Lancaster and it compared us to Fort Wayne, uh, Little Rock and a couple other, venue, uh, other cities. And we found we had more parking spaces than our competitors, but the net available, we had the least. That is a concern. We've tried to share that with our uh, city, father, uh, city leadership and just to kind of concern that we're gonna hit a glass ceiling if we don't have a place for these folks to park. So it's one thing we do need to keep an eye on. Dining and entertainment. Since 2009, when the convention center opened till today, the dining in downtown Lancaster has boomed. We see a lot of nice restaurants in downtown Lancaster. Uh, it, we hear it from our customers. In fact, one interesting uh, component, a lot of meeting planners for large conventions are cutting out meals they have to give to their customers so they can all go out on their own. A, the meeting planner is now saying, hey, the profitability of my event just got better. The attendees are getting the experience of downtown Lancaster and all of our rent restaurateurs are getting slammed on a Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday night. So those are some of the things that's happening with that. And that dining component is really helping us. The entertainment com component, we're not Vegas, but we have our own unique brand of uh, uh, entertainment, um, the Wear Center, the Fulton, the Trust, uh, the ballpark, some of those other um, amenities we have around. We see that as positive because they don't detract, they complement. I like to think that Vegas might detract a little bit. So that was, let me back up on that. So that was what event decision makers selection process beyond the convention center looks like. Let's look at why do event planners choose Lancaster County Convention Center in 2019. I use this year in it because if I use some prior years, that might be obsolete. They love our attentive staff. And when I mentioned uh, Jason earlier, he's a good example. I hear a number of customers who talk very well about his ability to go out and recruit. I even hear it from our competitors, which is concerning because they realize how good a job he's doing. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go to a conference with him in Louisville this summer, and uh, his efforts and his engagement with potential customers was strong, and he, his, his mannerisms and how he carries himself, you all would be proud, except he does have that South Carolina accent going on. That's really hard to sell as Lancaster. Authentic, anyways. So uh, we also are finding Lancaster's getting a lot of references. That's because of the good successes that folks are having when they are coming to Lancaster. So those references are climbing right to the top as, as decision makers are hearing about it. In fact, some cases, those references are why they're asking for the RFP, which is really phenomenal. Our lodging component is uh, climbing the list rather fast. As we talked about earlier, the Holiday Inn and the, uh, uh, or the the Hotel Lancaster becoming the Holiday Inn and becoming a branded full service hotel. That's been a great ad, uh, as well as the uh, amen amenities the Marriott added and their 115 rooms. So we now have a good core 
of lodging right in, uh, within walking distance of the convention center and allows those meeting planners to spend uh, dollars for transportation for those who may be further away and they can consolidate it because everyone may be paying a small sliver for that piece to go to those lodging uh, facilities that may require transportation. The other piece on this is um, when we look at the uh, event planners looking at this, this parking piece uh, is, as you can see, is a detractor. When we look at why we've lost business, that is also starting to climb another list. And I did not bring that list with me today, but I can tell you when we talk about lost business, uh, parking is getting to be a concern for us. So we don't have the answer for that. We are sharing our data with the parking authority so they can try to work with that, us as best they can. And trust me, they really have. There are days when they have asked some of their customers to move to other uh, uh, garages so the Penn Square garage um, can serve more of the attendees from out of town. That is really a, um, a, a new one, and we're grateful for their efforts on that. Uh, the transportation, again, is another piece of that. But you can see, it isn't just about what happens in the center, it's also your community. Okay, so how can the convention center increase its economic impact? Before I start this, I do want to point out that when we talk about economic impact, consumer confidence is a big part of it. So if the economy is, nationwide is taking a dip and your confidence to uh, and on your job or your, your spouse's job or whatever it might be or raising interest rates that's going to make your mortgage that's variable go up those things play into am I having hamburger or am I having steak it really does the other part of that equation is who's paying for it are you paying for something that you have a per diem that you're going to try to stay under or are you going to be fully re, um, uh, reimbursed so some of those things play into that as well so consumer confidence and who's paying the bill. So we also look to uh, increase the, the quantity of priority events. But I, I want to caution because we did uh, some napkin math a couple days ago and we were looking at one year where we had more priority events than another year, but our economic benefit actually went down. And the reason why that was is just because they hit the criteria doesn't mean they have as many days or doesn't mean those folks uh, had the opportunity to go out and do dining or they had other opportunities. So we have to be careful to t um, not broad brush and look at a number and say, oh, you've had more events, must be greater economic impact. Not so fast. We have to look at the big picture. What can we do to increase that, st that stimulization for spend? Help organization attendance build. And that's, a, that's getting more of attention in our industry. So if you, your organization has a convention next year, we'll send someone the year before to your convention with the idea of set up a booth, hand out some brochures, get them interested in Lancaster so they want to come. If we can do that and their attendance increases, now we all win. Attendance is a code word for another wallet in town and we want to attendance build or get more walls in town. And then the last piece is what can we do to have folks stay for an extra day? Uh, whether that means the hotel will, uh, that they're staying at provide an extra day at their group rate or does that mean we um, make available information about other events that are happening before or after their conference so they can schedule their transportation accordingly. Those are all things that play well into trying to get most out of our economic benefit. So we talked about uh, priority events uh, and I just wanted to make sure that we had that clear that we have two different categories. Priority one is 500 room nights on peak or 1,200 cumulative. Priority two events have 300 room nights or uh, uh, two, uh, 900 accumulative. For, for our size community, these are significant uh, drivers. We have a, a few events that uh, exceed that. I think uh, uh, ZenkaCon, which is the uh, anime uh, event that I think a lot of folks know. Um, a lot of the window seats at the local bars get a lot of uh, 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 patronage on those days. Not much turnover because folks just like watching people. Uh, we have also the, uh, uh, the, and it's actually a trade show, the quilter show 
is really a trade show slash consumer show and it's really rare that those types of events will provide economic benefit. But the reason why is they come from Toronto to uh, Virginia Beach, Boston Mass, some from Wisconsin, Vermont, and so they're staying overnight. Not all of them are in Lancaster, but a good number of them are in Lancaster as well. So we have some that just really go way and above these, uh, these values of priority one and two. Uh, growing Lancaster's tourism economic engine. We, meaning the Convention Center Authority, really are looking to find a way to engage small businesses who may not have the large budgets to engage uh, visitors to our community. So one of the things that we see as a short term, uh, when I say short term, the next two, two and a half years, is what tools can we use to get these small businesses to be able to engage with visitors and not just the ones at the convention center, engage in all visitors. Now, does that mean we set up, a, uh, we work and set up a co-op or do we find some other vehicle to get those get the word out to folks, but we do need to find a way that those small businesses um, get, to that get to that point and they are recognized by visitors and will use their facilities. So the, uh, my last slide here before we get to Q&A is uh, an initiative for 2020 and we're calling it Bring It Home. And frankly, uh, other communities do this and they go to hospitals or they go to uh, colleges and they say to them, or large uh, employers, and they say, hey, your folks belong to business, uh, belong to organizations. Uh, you know, does, do they have uh, conventions, meetings, conferences, and how can we get on there? And, and will, that, will someone champion that to bring it to Lancaster? I do know a lot of our competitors are out there doing that now, because if you have a member speaking for bringing it to Lancaster, that goes a long way in trying to get where we need to. And we find uh, that if our competitors are doing that, that we want to incorporate some of those best practices here in Lancaster. So uh, you know, I implore all of you, if you think of it or know someone who belongs to organizations, Ask them if they want to bring that organization to town with their meeting, their conference, their convention, their trade show, and it's only part of, it'll only help that economic engine and be a, a real service to Lancaster County and Lancaster City. With that said, let's move into the Q&A. at careers. So when folks are coming in the door, it's careers. Our last general manager started off as a dishwasher. I've been a busboy when I started off in the industry. So we look at it as a career. Yes, we have competitive wages to, uh, to bring folks on board, but if they're looking for a career, that's the second part of it. Because it's not just $15 an hour get in the, do in the door and you stay at that. That's not a career. We want folks who are, are looking for a career. And if they are, you, I don't care where you start, you'll be given those opportunities. And that early on in the project, we started doing that. We hired 175 people. Five years later, there was a significant amount of turnover, but that turnover allowed in those people who, people who started in the door to get elevating positions. And we still have a lot of them there today. It's 11 years later. So we do have competitive wages, but we also offer a career. Thank you. 